Hello, I'm Jennifer Johnson. I am the director of faith-based and community programs in the Los Angeles region for the American Red Cross. And I wanna welcome all of you to tuning in today. Um, thank you, there's a lot of things you could be doing with your time and so many of us now are spending so much of our days on Zoom and Teams calls. So thank you for trusting us with um, a half an hour. And uh, I wanna introduce our topic, which is, it's community coaching, it's LGTBQ plus sensitivity training. And this is our opportunity to build resilience in your community by sharing information on how you can be more compassionate and supportive to all of your members. As leaders out in the world, people are looking to you. Today, we will give you the skills and the confidence to shine in your compassion. Our mission at the American Red Cross is to alleviate human suffering and treating people the way they want to be treated and seeing people the way they want to be seen alleviates suffering and equate, uh, it creates equality. The month of June was chosen for LGBTQ Pride Month to commemorate the Stonewall Riots, which occurred at the end of June, 1969. As a result, many Pride events are held during this month to recognize the impact of the LGBTQ plus community. Before I introduce one of my favorite colleagues at the Red Cross, I wanna share with you a quote. And it's from Maya Angelou. And it says, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And that's what today's session is all about, is making people feel and, and um, that they are seen and they are heard and that it comes from an authentic place. So let me introduce my, one of my favorite colleagues at the American Red Cross. It's Jeannie Wu. She is disaster program, I'm sorry, senior disaster program manager, which really doesn't capture all that she does, um, but she's been with the Red Cross a long time and we're really lucky to have her to introduce our guests today. Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, thank you so much for the invite, Jennifer, and the really kind words. Uh, really happy to be joining you today. Obviously, um, this is a topic that is really important to me and really close to my heart. Um, I've spent almost a decade working with the Red Cross in the Los Angeles region, primarily in disaster services, and I'm very invested in how our services are provided for community members that are the most vulnerable, um, which is frequently members of our community, the LGBTQ plus uh, individuals. When they feel unsafe, it makes them less likely to come to us to seek services, and that may be true of your organization as well. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of work internally um, in the Red Cross as well as in the region to really sort of expand how we reach out to those <clears throat> individuals and the community in general. And so I'm going to introduce some panelists today that are going to talk about some steps that you can do with your community uh, and your organizations, um, but also uh, available for questions about how we're integrating this within the Red Cross's LA region response framework. So with that, I'd like to begin introducing Maria Mello. Um, one of our panelists is a good friend of mine. We met at the Red Cross. Uh, Maria was born in Colombia, um, and after she finished her MA in International Relations in Spain, she served briefly in Washington, D.C. with the Colombian government as a representative at the Organization of American States. Maria relocated to the L.A. region um, and restarted her professional career. Since 2014, she has worked as the regional communications manager at the LA Region Red Cross, uh, and then more recently as a policy and operations manager at the Los Angeles LGBT Center, which is the largest LGBT organization in the world. Joining her on the panel is, is someone else I'm also really fortunate to have made an acquaintance of recently, Robert Gamboa, uh, was born and raised in Lubbock, Texas. After graduating from the University of Texas at Austin, he moved to California in 2001. Having worked in IT for a couple of years, Robert became active in civil rights advancement for the LGBTQ community and communities of color, particularly around substance abuse, mental health, homelessness, and access to healthcare, as well as discrimination. For eight years, Robert has served on the West Hollywood 
uh, Lesbian and Gay Advisory Board and, in a rec and recently graduated with a master's degree in public policy from UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs. Yay, UCLA. <laughs> he currently works as a senior policy advocate and community organizer in the Los Angeles LGBT Center's Policy and Mobilization Department. So please join me in welcoming our two panelists. Now I have to figure out which is the right button. <laughs> All right, you can go ahead and start, Maria. I think, uh, um, I think I have your, I see a Facebook account. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey everyone. Um, it's really exciting to to be here with you today. I am completely, and Robert is as well, completely honored uh, to have the opportunity to speak to you and also just um, to partner with the American Red Cross um, that does such amazing humanitarian work uh, to help people when it matters most. And um, I have to say that the Los Angeles LGBT Center, uh, more to, I think one of the most important things, more than being the biggest service provider of LGBT specific services in the world is really the opportunity to also provide those humanitarian services and to be there for our community when it matters most and to partner with different organizations to also uh, help all of the people in our community. So uh, thanks so much. And uh, with that, um, we would like to do some intros in the next slide. And I don't know, Robert, do you wanna, do you wanna start your intro and then I'll, yeah. Jump in with mine. <laughs> sure. So I'm uh, Robert Gamboa. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, and uh, I've had the great pleasure of working with Ginny and Genia Levchenko uh, to start working on some um, LA regional LGBTQ advocacy within the American Red Cross. Um, and because of COVID, we haven't had a chance to really uh, uh, touch base on all that. But um, I'm really excited about uh, working with the Red Cross and, and trying to provide some, um, some expertise in that area. So glad to be here. Yay. And um, as I mentioned, I'm Maria. I'm Maria. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I uh, am a policy and operations manager at the Los Angeles LGBT Center. Um, I work a lot on um, immigrant rights and LGBT rights. Uh, I am a mom. I have two kiddos, a spouse. And I have to say that um, for me, it's just um, a complete like joy to be able to go to the center every day and work with um, LGBT folks from uh, different races, religions, national origins, I'm Colombian, genders, sexual orientations, and ages. And with that, we have over about half a million visits every year. Um, um, our programs are also programs that I think that for Robert and me are just not only uh, a motive of joy to advocate for LGBT rights, working with different government institutions, but also joy to be able to connect every day with the folks that we provide services through our um, services for people experiencing homelessness at our LGBT youth uh, center. Um, also uh, for our LGBT seniors who also experience homelessness in the city. Uh, and all across the country. We provide legal services to LGBT immigrants who are seeking asylum and safety here in America. Um, that's very important to me as a LGBT immigrant myself. Um, we have a culinary arts program that, pr that helps folks um, that have experienced homelessness in our youth program and in our senior services programs learn not only how to, the joy of, of cooking, but also the joy of cooking and being able to, to cook for others and getting a job doing so. Um, among those programs, I also think that is very important is our, our services to the trans community who are one of our, and trans people of color who are of the most vulnerable in our community and that come every day to us to ask for support and to ask for also how to be empowered to also um, basically find a, 
the place that they deserve in, in our community. So we are happy to every day to work for LGBT people to um, uh, obtain the, to be successful, to be healthy, and to just be part of our community. So thanks so much for having us. And uh, Robert, I, th I think you jump in there. I, I hope. Uh -huh. No, that's you. <laughs> it's me again. Okay, can you please do the next one? <laughs> um, okay, so what we're going to talk about in the next 20 minutes is a, basically a very quick course that we'd love to be the, the beginning of a long conversation about who is LGBTQ+, who are LGBTQ people in our larger LA region community, who are LGBT people, and what are their vulnerabilities, and what does it mean to be an ally and also some recommendations that we'd love to just share with you um, that we'd love for you to keep in mind or to, to consider when you're providing a welcome and safe environment in blue skies and in red skies. Um, and with that, let's jump into what we're gonna talk about. So who is LGBTQ? So I wanted to start by saying that all of these terms are, um, are are important to us and also um, um, it is important as they are part of our identity of who we are from the first day we opened our eyes and also it is part of like who we've be who have we've become with the years and learned to identify as so um, so the G I'm gonna start with the G Oh, oh, okay, I'll start with the L. Okay, lesbian, uh, a woman who's enduring physical, romantic, and or emotional attraction is to other women. Some lesbians prefer to identify as gay or as gay women. Um, something to avoid is, is using the word homosexual. Uh, for the LGBT community, that term has come to be a derogatory term and is considered nowadays in, in general as, as, as outdated and a bit of and offensive to lesbian and gay people. Um, the G for gay, um, it's the adjective used to describe people whose enduring physical, romantic, and emotional attractions are to people of the same sex. So there's gay men, gay people. Um, um, and then I'll jump to the B in the term that's, uh, so we have bisexual. Um, and this, uh, this refers to a person who has the capacity again to endure physical, romantic, and or emotional attractions to people of the same gender, but also to people of another gender. So some people, bisexual people experience it in a different way, different degrees. Uh, bisexual people don't need to necessarily have specific um, physical experiences to be bisexual. Um, um, it is definitely a, a term that, uh, that many identify, including me. So I usually use bi. Um, so in, in a way, I'm bi-national, bilingual, I speak Spanish, and I am bisexual. Um, another term is, uh, is the T, is transgender. Um, so this is an umbrella term for people who, whose gender identity and or gender expression differs from what is typically associated with the sex that they were assigned at birth. Um, people under the transgender umb umbrella may describe themselves using the word transgender or trans that I've, I, I think many of you have heard before. Um, um, and I'm sorry, I could go on, but I know we only have 20 minutes. Um, uh, the, I'm going to jump to the Q. Um, so this is an adjective that, you, that is used by some people or particular younger people. Actually, I don't know if younger. I'm 44. At some point, I, I identified as queer. Um, not anymore. But uh, whose sexual orientation is not exclusively heterosexual. Uh, they can refer to themselves as queer, queer person, queer woman. Typically, those who identify as queer uh, believe that the terms lesbian, gay, or bisexual are too limiting or fraught uh, with uh, cultural connotations. Um, um, and it's it's something great that if you all want to look into more into the terms, uh, I think I think Robert is going to share um, a link. And then there's a plus. That I think Robert wanted to jump in with the plus and to go on to a few more identities that we wanted to share. Sure. Thank you, Maria. Um, so most of you have probably heard LGBT or LGBTQ, and just as a quick note, that is 
um, we are grouped together in a political grouping, right? LGBTQ is a political grouping because we are typically fighting and advocating for uh, rights that are generally provided to heterosexual or cisgendered people, right? So, um, but that doesn't mean that LGBTQ people are the same. As Maria mentioned, we all have different identities and different genders, and those are completely different. And that's where the plus comes in, is there's a lot of different uh, dynamics to um, our identities. So I wanted to share with you this gingerbread person. And this kind of explores more of the world of LGBTQ+. Um, it's important to note that this is uh, this graphical representation has arrows in, in two directional, but, but it, this does not imply that these are um, a binary continuum, okay? That think, of, think of a 3D sphere and, and we're all different accesses becoming one of these expressions because we are, some of us, all of us fall at some point on of these scales, right? So the first one is genderqueer. And gender queer, or sorry, gender identity. Gender identity is what we feel on the inside, right? This is um, how we see ourselves, how we present ourselves, whether as male or female. And uh, as Maria mentioned, there's queer, and that uh, if people fall somewhere in the middle, right? That's what they would identify as gender queer because neither male nor female really implies applies to them. So this gender identity is how you in your head think of yourself. All right, it is the uh, it's the chemistry that composes who you are, your hormone levels, and how you interpret what that means, right? It's how you feel on the inside. Um, and then there's gender expression, and this is how you express your gender identity. So I identify as male, right? My gender identity is man, and I express myself generally as masculine. I, you know, I dress in what we in the society identify as men's clothing. I have a beard, and, you know, I present as male. So uh, the gender expression is how you demonstrate your gender, right? This is your, if for those of you that are psychologists, this would be your habitus, how you present yourself to the world, right? Um, and again, the scale would generally be masculine to one side and feminine to the other side. And in the middle would be androgynous where you can exhibit um, traits of both, like you are neither one or the other, or, um, and that's how you wish to present yourself. And then what we are more commonly associated with is our biological sex. Um, this is the sex that we are born as, um, either male or female or intersex. Um, so many of you may have uh, been, I've heard of the term hermaphrodite. Um, as uh, Maria said, some of these terms are no longer um, acceptable because they have harsh meanings to them now. So hermaphrodite is not commonly used, but intersex is. So uh, most people, if they have two X chromosomes, um, they would be female. And if they have an XY chromosome, they would be male. There are some people that are born with um, a mix of those and they are intersex. They have both genitalia of male and female. Um, and so intersex people are often, um, unfortunately, uh, forced into one gender or the other, and it creates a lot of gender dysphoria for them. Uh, and until they grow up and realize what's happening, they are forced to, um, to be one role or the other that they may not necessarily identify with. And this is also the same kind of experience for a lot of transgender people who, uh, grow, who are born as one sex, but know because of their gender identity that they are the opposite sex. And so they too experience a lot of gender dysphoria and emotional trauma from this, and they, they, um, they begin their sexual reassignment um, procedures. Um, now, all of those are completely different from sexual orientation. <laughs> sexual orientation is our attraction to someone else. Um, and as Maria said, it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical attraction. It could be an emotional attraction. It could be a spiritual attraction. It is what, we are, what or how we are attracted to another person. So, uh, you know, someone who is attracted to the same sex would be a homosexual, right? Homo meaning what? Someone who is attracted to the opposite, opposite sex would be heterosexual. And someone who's attracted to both sexes would be bisexual. Now, in that spectrum, there's pansexual, there's asexual, there's polysexual. There's a whole realm of different identities in sexual orientation itself. Um, I could go on for hours and hours about all of those, but um, I think it'll be easier. And um, I think John's going to share um, uh, a, uh, a clip here. But 
basically, I wanted to send you this link to the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. So here at that GLAD reference link, which uh, John will post in the chat box and you will be sent, after, uh, sent an email after this. Um, this actually has a reference guide to what all of those different labels mean. And you can also Google some on your own. What's great about this reference guide is it, um, it talks about, uh, it brings up terms that are no longer socially acceptable, right? Like hermaphrodite or, um, or, uh, or things that just aren't uh, well received. It also brings up stuff like how to ask questions, right? Sometimes we don't know how to address someone, right? Like what are your pronouns? How do you identify? Um, and so there's, there's a guide in there about how to ask those questions, right? It's pretty simple, right? If you, come, if you approach someone for the first time and you're not sure, you can be like, hi, my name is Robert. I use he, him, his pronouns and I identify as gay. What are your, how do you identify, right? That's all you have to ask. And I think anyone in our community would actually appreciate that you ask something that simply and then that opens the door to be able to say, oh, this person understands, right? This is the first time they may be uh, experiencing someone who understands. So in your crisis work and your, and your work out there in the field, that very little simple question is, hi, how do you identify? Here's how I identify can mean the world of difference, especially for transgender and non-binary people. By the way, non-binary is uh, people who do not identify as either male or female. Okay. Um, so uh, that is, uh, more of that is in that link there. And then um, we also wanted to mention Two-Spirit. Two-Spirit is, is uh, for those in the Native American tribes, it's, it's a very um, ancestral terminology. The Native American and indigenous people have expressed uh, Two-Spirit, which is basically the term for lesbian, gay, and bisexual, and some transgender individuals within these tribes. Um, and it's so, they've been much, they've been very accepting and welcoming of LGBTQ since before even America was around. And so I think this is a very beautiful terminology for this group of people. Um, so there's a, uh, John will provide a, a link in there too for the Tribal Institute, which explains a little bit more about that. Um, if you have any questions, we can answer those at the end, um, but I, we need to carry on. Uh, all right, Maria. You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so who are LGBTQ people in our community? And I just wanted to, start to stress that, you know, we are moms, dads, we are the person next door, we are the Red Cross volunteer, we are the shelter worker, we are policy makers, we're first responders that are there to help when it matters most. Um, we are part of the community and about 44.5% of adults in the United States identify as LGBTQ. That is, uh, that is a lot of people, that's about 13 million people. And I, what I do wanna share as well is that there are, not only are there 1 million same-sex couples living in the United States, but um, census data shows that uh, same-sex couples and also uh, children that are being raised by same-sex couples are in every uh, urban and rural area in the United States. Um, transgender people are zero, Point, or 0.6% of the US population. And um, what I wanna say is that here in California, um, we are 1.7 uh, million people. Um, so uh, this is not only a big group, but also we are in the community and we are uh, part of, are proud to, to, to work alongside all of you to make our home, our city, our county a better place. Um, let's jump to the next one. Um, and um, something that, as I highlighted a bit when I was talking about what the center does in our work, is that we continue to be a vulnerable community. Um, we have advanced in LGBT rights for, thanks to the decisions of the Supreme Court, as you all know. Um, um, we, uh, this just two weeks ago was a historic decision regarding workplace protections for LGBT people. 
but we continue to be a very vulnerable community. Just in LA, about 40% of the people of the homeless community is of LGBT youth that were rejected by their families. They come from all, all places in the, in the United States or here in our county. Uh, and to be a youth and to be uh, homeless also reflects basically what's still to be done, what we still have to do. Um, our LGBT seniors at the center are the fastest growing community of homeless seniors. Um, every, every, about every couple weeks or every week we hear of the death of the violent death of another transgender person of color or a transgender person in the United States. In the past two weeks as, as, the, we, as the country was you know, in pain, we also heard of the death of another two transgender people of our community. Um, this is a, a community also that is affected by hate incidents that have increased in the last three years, 19%. So with that, I do wanna say um, we, are, we are present and our community is still vulnerable. Um, Robert, if you wanna continue. Continuing that button. <laughs> so, um, so why does all of that matter? Uh, it matters because if we are already a disproportionately impacted community, if we are already struggling in good times and in normal times, imagine what the struggle is in times of crisis, in times of despair, and in times of disaster, right? So when Katrina hit, there was a lot of transgender people, a lot of especially Black uh, transgender folks, um, and LGBTQ folks who were not assisted, right? Because not only at that time, not only were there, there was very little protections. And so trying to identify LGBTQ families, trying to get transgender people into the right um, restrooms where they identify and feel comfortable with and to facilities that they feel comfortable with, um, it's a real challenge. And just to have a conversation when you're talking to any of these people, um, a lot of us don't know what to say, right? So, um, so what does it mean to be an ally? If you're truly here to understand how to help um, these communities that are disproportionately impacted, um, the next couple of slides will be like how to have some of those questions. And I think this framework applies to all types of situations. Right now we're, um, we're experiencing a lot of racism and a lot of white supremacy in this country as we've exhibited through all of the protests and the riots that have happened. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's been important for us, even in our work at the LGBT Center, like how do we make sure that we're advocating for our black community, for our brown community. And um, so this framework will be, I think, helpful for everyone. So um, what allyship, right? What does it mean to be an ally? And this, this sort of is like looking across the continuum. For a lot of us, we start at this place of apathy. We don't understand anything, right? We don't know, right? So at some point, we may become more aware, right? We start to understand basic concepts, um, and we uh, start to act, um, we're, we're really not active on, on in, in terms of helping other people, but we're a little bit more aware. But when we do start to activate, when we do start to help, we become a little bit more informed, right? We are seeking knowledge and we start to understand diversity when asked or prompted. Um, and then at some point we become advocates. We are committed to helping these uh, populations, these oppressed communities, how to um, how to be included, right? And I think that's part of a lot of the work that we've been doing with Jeannie and, and Jenya uh, in trying to to uh, help all of us be inclusive, right? That's the goal. How do we all be inclusive and make sure no community is oppressed, right? Um, and I think it's important that we use some of these stronger words um, because that's that's how a lot of the oppressed community is feeling. So to be an ally is to one acknowledge that the oppression of some enables the impression of all. Challenge and dismantle this oppression of others as if it were your own, right? These are some very basic questions to start to think about when you're, when you're working with these communities that are not your own. Um, stand up even, and especially when it's uncomfortable. You will experience a lot of discomfort when you're asking yourself these questions and when you're talking through um, with, with these communities, right, with our communities. Um, you, we all grow through pain, right? So when we're experiencing some of these discomforts um, and you're asking the right questions, such as you'll find on GLAD, the GLAD website, 
um, you'll be able to better understand, right? Because you're seeking knowledge to help communities. Um, three, acknowledge that even though you feel pain, the conversation is not about you, right? Many of us come from a place of privilege, privilege whether we're able-bodied, whether we're male or white or have money or whatever, because we can do something, there are people that cannot or do not have the same privileges as we do. So it is important that we use our privilege for the good of others, right? Um, and that's how we become a, a more complete and whole society. Four, be responsible for your own knowledge and education on topics of oppression. So this is where you get to go do your homework and, and learn a little bit more about what, uh, what these communities need or what they hope for in trying to find equality and equity. Those are two completely different things. Um, five, transfer the benefits of your privilege to those who lack it. So this is what I was just mentioning. How are you gonna support and uplift these communities by using your privilege, right? Use your powers for good. I'll say that again, use your powers for good. All of you here on this presentation today have something that you can contribute to someone else to lift their experience and help them become a more complete human being. Um, and I think that is probably one of the, the highlights of this whole experience, right? Now, um, because of that, because we have some privileges, we need to be, res we have certain responsibilities, right? So, um, so we, uh, I like this little quote here, we are acting, uh, we are not acting out of guilt, but rather out of responsibility, right? If we are truly friends and neighbors and American citizens and, you know, and, and faith-based people, um, we want to make sure that our friends and neighbors and citizens and faith-based people and undocumented people and whoever also can share in our experience, right? So, um, so this means that when we're going through these uncomfortable conversations, we're going to we need to build our capacity to receive criticism. There will be some things that come out that will feel uncomfortable because that means we're acknowledging where we may have been complicit in some activities or words, some of the words we say, how hurtful they can be. Um, we may be called out in certain ways because, um, you know, like Maria mentioned, there are things that are no longer appropriate or comfortable for oppressed communities to hear. So, um, so we need to be honest in where we stand and also be accountable when we make mistakes so that we can fix them right away because we can. Every mistake is fixable and it's a learning opportunity. All of this is a learning opportunity. Um, and, uh, and look at feedback as a gift, right? It's a chance to learn, to grow, and to do better. Um, the next step is embrace the emotions that come with allyship. Um, it is going to be uncomfortable sometimes, but sometimes it'll be great, right? Either way, you're going to be challenged. You may feel excited, you may be hurt, who knows what the experience is going to entail? And sometimes in a moment of crisis, you may not even have an opportunity to cope or, or, or process that experience, but just know that we're gonna have to work through it, right? And American Red Cross is really great with some lot of emotional and mental health support. Um, we prioritize the needs of the people we work with, right? Again, how are we gonna use our uh, priority and our uh, privilege to help other people? So we are responsible for our own self-care um, we do not expect these people we seek to work with to provide emotional support, right? If I'm going through to help um, a transgender person, uh, you know, say there's an earthquake and rumble and, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm begging for them to help, you know, and I'm here to help them. And I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. So the best thing I can do is be like, how can I be of service to you? How can I help you? Um, what, would, what would be the most in powerful thing for me to do here in this moment, right? Um, in a crisis situation, we don't often stop to think about some of these experiences and how people may feel. Um, so um, how may I best serve you? It's a very simple question, right? And once you're able to open that door, you can then you can say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I identify as this. How do you identify? How can I best serve you? Um, and always stay calm. <laughs> you know, we don't want, we want to be disalarming and we want to be helpful and meaningful. So um, the more calm and, and, and um, present you are, the better it's going to be. Um, also, do not expect any special awards or recognition. Just because you helped someone through something does not mean you get a gold star. We're not going to you know, put a, a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Um, these are very basic actions that everybody should be doing um, as we go forward. Um, but, uh, but you can sleep with your, you know, put your head on the pillow at night and know you did a good job, right? And that you helped lift somebody up. 
I think these actions, you know, if we lift all of our community up together, imagine how amazing our world would be, right? We wouldn't have disparity. We wouldn't have inequity. We wouldn't have inequality. So I think that is a goal that all of us can reach for. Um, and then uh, I'm turn over to Maria for this next part. Thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, we ha we have some re recommendations um, that we thought might be helpful to c for creating a welcoming environment. Always a, every like what we've seen like in different settings or institutions that we've worked with organization is that there's um, there's a few steps that we can start by doing. Uh, one is definitely to re recruit LGBT folks to work with us, to be like our partners, right? To work as alongside us um, so that we can work together in these times of emergency or in times when things are calm. Because um, that is, is one of the most helpful things to be prepared for disaster for, and in general. Um, um, please definitely uh, start uh, respect the LGBTQ family structure and the relationship status. As, as families come to ask for help in times of disaster, there will, be, there, there will be LGBTQ families who have possibly come from spaces where they felt either discriminated or where they feel unsafe. What can we do to make them all feel safe in, in, a, in a disaster response is just to respect and recognize their family structure. Um, respect an, an individual's stated or presented gender identity or expression. As Robert mentioned, uh, a standard hello um, is, not a, is not enough. It is also, uh, my, name is, my name is Maria, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, how about you? <laughs> um, ensure safety for LGBTQ individuals. Some folks um, in, in, uh, in a, you know, when they're confined into space, as we all know, we come from different backgrounds, different places, and we're in one place to try to stay safe. What can we do for all of us to feel safe? As LGBTQ individuals, we, we wanna know that we'll be protected from harassment, that we'll have access to the correct medical needs. If there's somebody that's, age, age, for example, HIV positive, will they need their, or experiencing this, how will they have access to the medication they need? Bathroom and shower access and confidentiality about what they wanna share with you as a disaster worker or what they're not ready to share with others in this space. Definitely add, please, I'm sorry, go ahead. Can I add on that? Um, yeah. I think uh, what's important, especially around like bathroom and shower access and confidentiality, um, there are, so there are certain, you know, these disasters happen all over the world. So there may be some countries where there are zero protections for LGBTQ people. And there are even 29 US states that do not have protections for LGBTQ people, right? So, um, so Louisiana, for example, is not one of them. And when Katrina hit, um, it made it a little bit more challenging for people to access the right facilities, right? When you force someone to use a facility that they do not identify with, it brings a whole new level of trauma that we can't even comprehend. Um, and some of the stories that came out of that experience were that um, when, you, when you force a trans woman to use male facilities, um, there, uh, there's a, a, you know, a high risk of violence against that person, um, rape, murder, um, and, and all sorts of situations that, that come about simply because we don't understand, right? We don't understand what they're going through. So we don't wanna put them in more danger. <laughs> We're trying to help them out of danger. And so we don't wanna put people into the, into the wrong situation, right? Um, and confidentiality is also super important. Some people are not out yet because as Maria said, there's a lot of oppression and discrimination and bigotry that still happens. So if, uh, if I'm not out yet and you said, oh, you know, we've got a gay guy here who needs help and all of a sudden my family who didn't know attacks me or disowns me or, or puts me in a situation that's, um, that makes the situation worse. So like these are, these may seem like simple little things to you, but these could be a crippling experience for the person you're trying to help. Right? Um, yeah, and then that, so that kind of ties into like the next point. Remember that LGBTQ families 
do have full protection in California. So we're here in California, we're here in LA County. Um, California has the UNRU civil rights law. I don't know if you know that, but that is basically our own bill of rights. So uh, and it's, an, it's an extension that specifically outlines that sexual orientation and gender identities are fully protected in everywhere in California, including public accommodations. So that would mean restrooms and access to schools and access to shelters and access to hospitals. Um, so, uh, so if you're somewhere helping someone and you're like, wait, you can't come in here or whatever, that's not true. Um, you, we are fully protected here in California. Like I said only 21 states have these level of protections. <laughs> but uh, so in California, so that would be good to know and you're doing your homework is which states have which protections. Robert, and let me um, jump in there before I think you're closing. Um, um, the, something around LGBT families, um, like, and I'll, I, I'm definitely feel comfortable sharing. Um, for example, when I when I travel out of state, because I know that as LGBT as Red Cross workers, sometimes or volunteers, we're also sometimes deployed to other states uh, that have different legislation, different than California. Um, I think something is to take into account in these uh, disaster responses or in shelters is that you might have LGBT families come to you that um, are living in a state where they don't feel as safe as they are in California. Um, I know, for example, when I travel to another state with my wife and my kids where I know we don't like we don't have the same protections as like parents of them. Like we travel with our like adoption papers or all of this stuff. So this is just to show that even though we've accomplished so much, um, we are still vulnerable in different states. So some, that's something to definitely keep in mind as you, um, as you deploy. Yeah, thank you for that, Maria. Um, and really the final point uh, why we're all here today is just a reminder that there's a lot of vulnerable communities out there. Um, whether they're impoverished communities, communities of color, LGBTQ communities. Um, women are often uh, vulnerable communities, especially against domestic violence. Um, so what can you do to be the best support person you could be as an American prosecutor here? Um, and understanding um, how to make that bridge and connect to that person who's struggling. And this applies both in good times and bad times, right? I think the term here is blue skies and red skies. <laughs> Um, but, <coughs> uh, you know, we're basically like, how, how are you going to be an ally and use that framework that we just kind of, uh, breeze through. We will send you this uh, presentation, obviously, but, uh, I think that's kind of the, the gist of it. I don't know if we're out of time or not. I think we've probably gone over, but, um, I think, uh, now we have an opportunity for questions. Uh, so there are a couple things. There was a question earlier about defining cis, um, and I'll let Robert or Maria could take that in one minute um, because I wanted to circle back to what Maria brought up and Robert also <clears throat> addressed. As a Red Cross volunteer, you're empowered to take what we've just taught you in terms of training, what Robert and Maria have presented, with you on deployments, right? In fact, we encourage that. As an organization, we've adopted um, zero, a zero tolerance policy on discrimination in terms of sexual orientation. Um, and, and so all are welcome in our shelters, right? Um, that is the baseline assumption, whether you're in Louisiana or New York or California or Washington or Alaska or Guam, right? And so, incumbent on each of us is to be a good advocate. And if we can take that next step is to be an ally, right? Where, wherever we are, whether we're in Texas or Louisiana, a deep red state or a, or a blue state, nothing exempts um, an individual, uh, part of the LGBTQ plus community from facing some kind of discrimination. And when you're a volunteer with the Red Cross or your workforce with the Red Cross in whatever capacity, particularly if you represent the organization, <laughs> we encourage you to make your voice heard, right? Um, and so I just wanted to kind of put a pin on that as someone who does a lot of deployments um, and is proud of the work that I do all across the country, right? I, I would hope that all of you would join me um, in, in making your voice heard, right? In making a more uh, accepting environment for our community. So 
Robert, Maria, did you, one of you want to address CIS first, just defining sure. that? And I, I'm sorry that I missed that, um, but it's in the, it's in the GLAD def, uh, terminology. Um, so the question is cisgender versus transgender. Cisgender is a relatively newer term, and it basically is um, the sex you were born with, right? So if I, I was born as a male, I am a cisgendered male. That means I am this, I identify as the sex that I was born with. A transgender person identifies with the sex, um, the opposite of what they were born with, right? So, um, so that's how you can look at it. So cisgender um, is, you know, if you don't change anything about the way you're born, you are cisgendered. And that's how you identify. I hope that's a relative. It's also in the GLAD um, uh, description. Are there any other questions? I can't see the thingy. <laughs> Robert, there is one more question from the Q and A, uh, which we will um, we can answer live. Sure. What's one or two specific things that managers can do for their teams in a work environment to help LGBTQ plus individuals feel welcome? and build a culture of inclusion in the department. Great, thanks. Um, I'm gonna go back here. So um, as Maria pointed out, like I think it's important to make sure we recruit LGBTQ staff members and community volunteers to assist, um, not just in times of emergency, but in building our framework. As Jeannie said, like it's important to lend your voices. Um, I will uh, just note that, for example, right now, that, so the LGBTQ Center has been, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Los Angeles LGBT Center has been a radical organization, right, fighting for LGBTQ rights um, since day one, right? So, uh, <laughs> my screen block. Um, but in this time of, uh, of racism, of stark racism, we've had to really take a look at some of our infrastructure and make sure that have we been complicit in some of this work and, and, and properly responding to community of color. And so, um, so we're really having to take a hard look at ourselves. And sometimes that's what some of us need to do is take a hard look at ourselves and make sure we're including all of the voices necessary to have the right framework, to have the right structure, to have the right voice, right? If you're just, um, if you're going out there and you think you're doing the best that you can do, which we've always thought, then, uh, but we've never included our black voices or our brown voices, then we're part of the problem, right? So, um, so this goes back to some of those other points, um, you know, like doing our homework and asking those hard questions, bringing all the right people to the table to make sure you're having equity and equality. Equality may mean something as easy as, yes, we all have the same rights, right? Our constitution says, hey, all men are created equal, but we know full well that that doesn't apply. <laughs> Right, this, our, you know, we're literally fighting to make sure that everyone has the same rights. Right, we're bringing up these communities. Why are transgender people not basically have very few rights? Uh, women don't even have full protections in this country. Right, so um, how do we how do we get people there? And that means equity. Equity means every single person has the same access to the same resources. Right, so um, so maybe that's a basic way to start your question: is how do we become an organization of equity? and bringing all the equal voices and having equal representation to the table. How's that? <laughs> uh, any other questions, John or Axe? No, no more questions in the Q&A or chat that I can identify. Okay. Sorry, I don't know if you, if you all do the snapping, but we, as activists, when we're at, <laughs> doing work and we say something, the other activist goes like this. So it's not, it's not like hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to present to you and just shared a little bit of light on this realm. Um, Maria's contact information and my contact information are here. Feel free to reach out to us anytime. Like we're happy. This is our, our field work. We, we thrive on, on policy work to make these communities more equitable. So um, do not hesitate to contact us. And, I, and actually, I will be working with Jeannie. Hopefully, we'll resume soon on our, on our work together. Um, but also, happy Pride, right? This is also, a, you know, as Maria said, we've had some big victories in the Supreme Court this week, um, particularly granting workers' rights to LGBTQ workers, right? There's a little bit more protection. And so those 29 states that don't <laughs> have equal protection. We're all going to do it. <laughs> Those 29 states that didn't have protection for LGBTQ workers, 
done, now we do, right? So this is how lending your voice and doing those actions can really take shape into something bigger for all of our communities. So thank you for letting us be here today. Yeah, thank, and also want to say thank you so much. I hope I'm not muted, but um, I hope uh, Robert and I uh, both volunteer when we, when we can with the Red Cross. Um, so we hope to see you on this path of uh, humanitarian service. Thank you. Thank you. Or Jennifer? I think it's you, Jeannie. <laughs> uh, is it me? Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. For sorry, I was just reflecting on what uh, we've all discussed and seeing some of the kudos in the in the chat. Actually, for Robert and Maria, um, thank you, everyone who uh, is recognizing their uh, presentation and the hard work they put into just over the last few years, like trying to make some change in our community. Uh, so the Red Cross is always looking for more engaged volunteers, but we also hope that you take this back to your own organizations. If you aren't already volunteering with the Red Cross, begin to have some of those, you know, really difficult conversations. It's the same is true. Robert and I work on a group uh, within the Red Cross that's looking to try and make some change in how we do sheltering and how we approach sheltering uh, in the communities that are as diverse as they are. How do we move a hundred plus year old organization, right, into some, uh, some, some broader acceptance, right, uh, overt and covert acceptance. So um, if you'd like to join us, I think, <laughs> oh yes, your mug, that's what Jennifer was talking about. Uh, <laughs> if you'd like to join us, I think uh, our host, John Axel, will drop the link for COVID resources, um, volunteering opportunities with the Red Cross. Uh, but of course, I always encourage you as well to look at the Los Angeles LA, uh, Los Angeles LGBT Center. I'm sorry, I'm used to the old, what the old, <laughs> I, uh, I conversely used to also volunteer with them um, when I had a lot more time. So uh, I encourage you to look at the different resources that are available in LA. We're really fortunate here in Southern California and there are many organizations working to make change. So thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, and Robert's information is there and Jennifer has access to my information, of course, which I'm happy to share if you have any questions about Red Cross's disaster response um, and this community. Thank Great. you again, everyone. Thank you so much. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. <laughs>